what you said at the end, I mean, uh, about the similarity between Islamist and uh, nationalist, Arab nationalist, uh, was a surprise for me because uh, uh, in Egypt, in uh, in uh, what's called Sham, which is Lebanon and Syria, nationalism has got a different attitude actually. For a certain reason, there's a very serious conflict between um, nationalism, which in Egypt, for example, called Nas Nasserite and the Islamic Brotherhood, uh, because, what well, to me, because uh, Nasser, he was in, in prison, tortured them, and he did a, a lot of things against the Marxist as well. Uh, but uh, there was, um, I'm worried that uh, because also because uh, because Nasser he did a lot of uh, torture and imprisonment and uh, conflict with the Marxists, especially the far uh, left Marxists. That's also this historical conflict. But uh, uh, if I want to speak about the Arabic uh, nationalism. In Egypt, I would say it's maybe totally different from uh, Tunisia, but still I know in Tunisia I've got a very famous group, I think it was maybe in the 70s, it is called Asma Sifidawla, who uh, was uh, he's Egyptian, but he has got, for some reason, uh, a group in Tunisia, and he believed in a sort of combination of Turtiskian and nationalism, and he believed as a nationalism as a step towards the global revolution. But as ideology, he adopted the Marxism as uh, so he was totally different from Nasser uh, around that. Uh, in Egypt, in the 70s and 80s, because Nasser attacks the left wing, that was uh, the left wing if you, um, in, a, uh, in the parties called Atagama, which was uh, a group of uh, Marxists with uh, Nasserian. Nasrat because Nasrat at the time didn't have the right to have a party. There was a conflict, but there was a cooperation. And there was a lot of uh, conferences, especially in Lebanon, for what's called a new nationalist movement, which uh, uh, they, uh, they discredited a Basque party in Syria and Iraq, and they said that we had to adopt um, some a new agenda, especially about freedom which is the democratic freedom before, because uh, during Nasser, Saddam, and other uh, nationalists, they were focusing a lot the freedom of the, the nation against the colonization. Um, so I can understand what you say, but at the same time, I think we need also to be more uh, distinguished about group of uh, uh, nationalists and I think there are a lot of progress now in nationalism, especially who uh, distance themselves from uh, the Basque Party in, uh, in Syria and Iraq. Thank you. Well, I, I, I thought it, uh, Mohammed made a very important point when he said that there's a kinship mm -hmm. between the Islamists and the secular nationalists. But to see why that's so, I think you have to start from a class approach. Because what we're talking about, societies that are dominated by imperialism, historically in the colonial form, but in lots of ways, still, still today, uh, in which historically the local bourgeoisie is, is very weak, often such as exists is, is foreign in some, some sense. So the dynamic of, of nationalism um, is against imperial domination and for the the construction of an effective capitalist state in these in these in these societies, and I think that if you look historically, there are plenty of situations where the Islamists articulate a similar aspiration. You know, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood in the colonial period, they're a mass movement that engages in armed struggle against the Brit British occu occupation, and there's competition between them what become the Nasserites and, and the communists as to who's going to lead, lead the national struggle. Similarly, why did the revolution, why did the Islamists end up victorious in Iran? Critically, in part, because they presented themselves as a force fighting, fighting imperialism. So, and, and I think that reflects the common class roots of both nationalism and the mainstream 
Islamist movements, but there's still, I mean, I'm not saying that there's no difference between the, 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 the kind, kinds of movements. And it's certainly true, in the period from the 40s through to the 70s, it, the secular nationalists of different forms, the Nasserites, the Baathists and so on, were the dominant political force in cha challenging imperialism. And it's very important to ask why, what, what, what was it, how, how did they allow themselves to be so thoroughly defeated that, the, um, that they became supplanted by the Islamists? I, I think that's an important question we should try and address in this meeting. Well, you think that, uh, about the Islamic yes. Brotherhood, uh, uh, don't you know historically that it was created by the British? <laughs> but they still no, no, shot uh, and the British uh, uh, Hassan al-Banna, the founder of Islamic Brotherhood, he was taking salary from the British government and there's a document proof that now. Okay. They still fought the British. Yeah, yeah they fought. Yeah. Mohammed, yeah. would you like to respond to those points and then we can take some more? I, I mean, uh, I have exactly the same answer. I, I, we are all aware that they have very big differences in their ideology, obviously. But uh, the Islamists and the nationalists mainly, when, when, when the nationalists were uh, popular, they were popular exactly because they, they opposed colonialism and imperialism and they promised the uh, liberation of Palestine and uh, the uh, development of the economy and the culture and so on. And that's exactly what the Islamists uh, are popular for right now. They are just dependent on the countries, more or less religious, more or less fundamental, and using more or less uh, you know, uh, religious uh, discourse. In Tunisia, it is much, much less. They are really almost like uh, right-wing conservative nationalists. Uh, and, and that's how, how they are portraying themselves. And uh, uh, there are even some people are asking, is Nahda the new secular Islamist movement? So, Sometimes the barrier is not a different of kind; it's a dif different of uh, a difference of, uh, how do you say, intensity. It was more nationalist, or was more religious, or more fundamental. And uh, uh, although the nationalists in, in the, uh, our country started more with a uh, type of um, uh, state capitalism, they they all after. 20 or 30 years, depending on the country, uh, went back to uh, neoliberalism that was imposed by, uh, by the foreign uh, powers. Uh, the Islamists have started from neoliberalism, so on the economic level, they end up very, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another in Tunisia uh, officially said that they have nothing uh, to oppose, uh, they don't oppose at all. Uh, ben Ali's policies, they, they only uh, disagree with, with corruption. And I don't think that will be enough to, to convince mm -hmm. the, the population and the working class. Mm -hmm. I think this last point you made, uh, Mohammed, about the state capitalist route that the national uh, movements took in power, that the nationalist regime took, is very, very important. And there's another affinity there between the nationalists and the communists. And that um, from the very beginning, the Arab nationalists seemed to, understandably, for some of the reasons Alex gave, wanted to seize the state. They wanted to seize the state from the colonial powers. But then there was an absolute conviction, I think, right across the Middle East, as across much of the, what we then used to call the third world, I suppose we call the global south today, that the state itself was the instrument of development. And that seizing the state and, and using the state for national development was the project or to, or to establish a national capitalism was, was the main task at hand and the nationalists went about that for several generations in a, in a very focused way. But of course you can't use um, instruments of uh, repression and oppression and exploitation as instruments of liberation and, and the, the, the mobilisation of the state was a mobilisation against the mass of the people by definition all, all, all the way through. And I think that there's, there's a huge amount in common with Stalinist tradition there. Um, in fact, and indeed, um, if this doesn't sound too simplistic, I mean, with the worldview of the Islamists as well.
for them too, it's the state itself which can be used um, as part of the project of, of development, welfareism and so on, in their case. And these are, I don't, can you have three sides of the same coin? I don't think you can, can you? Can you? <laughs> three that, sides of the same coin. <laughs> Arab nationalism, <laughs> communism and Islamism do have certain very important common assumptions and they're class assumptions uh, about doing, uh, initiating agendas for change. Uh, not just on behalf of people, but in place of the struggle of the mass of people. And that, that's what's a common thread which he, seems to me unites, unifies these different elements. Um, and the, the, the nationalists in power, people like Nasser, Nasser and the various Ba'athists and uh, Gaddafi and the, the, uh, uh, the FLN in Algeria, um, have been highly authoritarian, uh, authoritarian, very, very elitist, I mean, these are the main characteristics, seems to me, of, of Islamism too, that uh, highly centralised, very authoritarian, very mistrustful, the mass of people, very, very mistrustful and contemptuous often at the same time. And I think we can, you know, we can see quite a lot of that, what's been going on in the last few days in Egypt. And, and in fact, the, the way that the Muslim Brotherhood has been pulled here and there, especially in the last week, that uh, on the one hand, the Brotherhood re completely rejected the demands of Tahrir against the SCAF. On the other hand, when it became clear to the leadership of the Brotherhood that many of their members, especially their youthful members, were deeply involved in the resistance in Tahrir, then they found edged towards the movement and edged back again. Um, but essentially, there's a, there's a rather contemptuous attitude towards the, the mass of the, of, the, of the people by all these movements. And finally, um, uh, we turn to the point which you made, a very important point, I think, Mohammed is that the way that these projects end up, particularly the way the Nationalist Project has, has ended up, is by embracing the neoliberal agenda. So every single one of the nationalist movements which came to power at various times in the Arab world, up to including the movement which is regarded as still as being the most difficult for Western imperialism to manage, I suppose the Ba'athists in Syria, whom you have referred to several times, I mean, the Assad family are, you know, the most aggressive neoliberals in Syria. And I'll just close this in there rather. If I may just share an anecdote as well, as you share a well, well. When I went for the first time across the border from Jordan to Syria a couple of years ago, I had been on that border crossing um, from Amman to Damascus. And some people might know this. You cross over and you, there's this usual complicated thing going across the borders with border posts and passports and so on and so forth. And you go across the Jordanian side and there's this very dusty type of derelict building where you can go in for duty free, to buy your duty free as you leave Jordan. And you cross over, get your passport stamp, go into Syria, and immediately you're ushered in to this gigantic, glitzy type of five-star hotel type building which you can buy your duty free, which is, you know, every drink, perfume and so on from around the world is there. And I said to my, the friend I was with, you know, what's going on here? Cousin of the president, of course, had the franchise and had mobilised, you know, all his newfound commercial freedom. And it was really, it was a little metaphor for the way that Syria has gone in recent years. So every single one of these nationalist currents has ended up, you know, with people who are very, very aggressive liberalisers uh, and the like. Um, so just a few thoughts there, but others, colleagues, comrades, yes? Uh, just following from what you said, it, it seems to me if you don't address the problem of imperialism, and these neoliberal economic po policies, nothing, nothing is going to change. Mm. Even the Islamists, the nationalists, the communists, if, if they go to power, nothing will change. If you don't go to the masses and educate them and tell them about these problems, about these issues, the problem in Tunisia, tu Tunisia was portrayed as um, a developed country. They have a, a very good growth, uh, economic growth all over the years. It was a model for the Arab world. But then when you go to, to, to the, the country inside, you see the huge inequality, the huge poverty, and you discover that the problem is the economic model. If, if the Nada is not willing to change this, I, I, I don't see any change coming. In Tunisia, there will be new elections in one year, and I think we, we might, might see big surprises in one, in one year, and maybe the Nada will be very surprised because 
uh, the population is uh, literally ungovernable. Uh, they uh, uh, yesterday actually I, I heard something quite insightful from normal man in a bar saying, uh, "I never vote for people to govern me. So I vote for someone so he doesn't govern." Uh, I basically saying that he he chose the. Uh, the uh, party the least likely to win and voted for them, so <laughs> <laughs> so they don't govern. But this is ex uh, maybe uh, uh, explaining the uh, attitude of the people. Yes, we vote you in, but we are not uh, going to allow you to to govern in the same way that uh, Ben Ali uh, governed before and Bourguiba before, and uh, and uh, the population is very likely to vote out. Another after one year, because they will be they will be unable to address very burning issues, uh, and uh, you know the people who went out in the streets and uh, confronted the the police and the army and the police uh, are not ready to wait for five years uh, until the another can fix some of the issues, uh, you know counting on a very high growth and a very optimistic uh, uh, world environment, which is never going to happen. So uh, with, with the global crisis and internal uh, crisis, the, the growth is going to be very sluggish. And, and with the same neoliberal uh, policies, uh, they're not going to have many means to improve the uh, standard uh, of life of 80% of, of the population. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how uh, they're going uh, to, to fare in the next election in one year. Uh, another very important thing, um, there has always been a very interesting uh, relationship between Tunisia, the Tunisian revolution and the Egyptian one, an effect of continuous feedback. Uh, just to go back to the revolution, which is just a few months ago. Uh, you know, the Egyptian, after seeing what happened in Tunisia, they announced the Egyptian revolution will, be, will start the uh, 25th of January, I think. Uh, and they used very similar means that the Tunisian youth uh, population did. And then uh, they started a new thing, they called it a day of rage, a term that we did not use in, in Tunisia. And immediately, uh, the Tunisian, uh, two days later, staged a day of rage, uh, and started using this the same uh, you know, uh, language and the same methods against the uh, government of uh, Mohamed Hanoushi, which came after Ben Ali. Uh, and it had a very big effect, you know, the, the I think the Egyptian revolution allowed the Tunisians to, to continue theirs because otherwise it could have been hijacked not by the Islamists but by the same party, the same people, the same mafia and so on. Uh, and I think this again pushed the Egyptian revolution further and now I think what's happening in, in Egypt is going to have a huge effect in, in, in Tunisia. And uh, you know, maybe this will happen before the end of the year. I mean, of the one year mm -hmm. uh, which is given to another to, to that. So. Yeah, I mean, two things. One is that what I mean, people are talking about the, the similarities or differences between nationalist and Islamist movements. And I mean, I, I agree with what people were saying about the, their class nation. I think it played itself out. You said in your introduction how there was in, in the in the nationalist movement a tradition of kind of a verbal anti-imperialism and, 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 and those kind of uh, political positions, but then actually a, a real mistrust of, of the mass of people and of workers that can actually, which, I mean, address those questions practically. And I think we kind of saw the same thing play itself out in the region during the revolutions, that maybe movements that we looked, that, that we looked to in the last kind of decade or whatever in the region as, as kind of you know, with, while accepting all their mistakes as, you know, examples of, of the most militant anti-imperialists, you know I mean, like whether they're like Hamas or Hezbollah or these kind of organizations that I think 
we uh, p p people talked about a lot uh, as uh, d d in, in the last decade and during the anti-war movement. They may be, I mean, logically, because they were the only people that were there, I mean, they were the only people that were organizing. As soon as the revolutions broke out, these organizations took extremely, extremely uh, uh, aggressive and reactionary positions towards the revolutions uh, and, and, and condemned them. And obviously that comes from I mean, where the money comes from, right? And that if, if the regime that, that uh, or, or the friends of the regime that finance you are, are in too much danger, you, you, you might not want to go and, and support that too much, but also because of, of how they conceive the road to power and, and, and the possibility of change, that there's, there's, there's a real fear, I think, of, of ordinary people in, 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 in their power. Um, but then I kind of wanted to ask, which is, you know, we talk about the left and, and nationalism or the, the, the left and, and the Islamic movements. Now we feel we're quite clear about where the Islamic movements are for the moment. And I'm quite unclear about where the left is. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, there's a sense that the left is reorganizing itself. Maybe, uh, at, at least I, I know a little bit, uh, a tiny little bit more about, about what, what happens in Egypt and in Tunisia with this creation of the, the new Workers' Party in an attempt of bringing together the kind of progressive forces inside of the workers' movement and, and that kind of stuff. I know there's to some extent a reorganization of independent trade unions and an attempt to organize workers on, 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 uh, in, in, in the workplaces away from the, the old traditional trade unions. But I don't know, I don't know if, if yourself or the people in the room can kind of contribute to that discussion. If we're talking about the, 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 the Islamists, the nationalists and the left, it feels always to me that in those discussions everybody's quite clear about what the Islamists and the nationalists are doing and obviously there's big debates that need to be had about you know, people are pointing towards, you know, the Islamists, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, or they're not going to do it. Okay, that's, that's one question. But, I mean, what's happening on our side at, at, at the same time? I did, I did want to come in about that particularly. It's just more, just to, to, to say a bit more about the nationalists. Because I think, but because the, the, the surviving forms of secular nationalism are so degenerate, it's easy to, it, it's tempting to sort of dismiss what they were like in their, their heyday. And I think it's important, I mean, as, as my was saying, we're talking about absolutely massive struggles that had physically to be crushed. You know, the CIA and the Ba'athists, you know, physically overthrew the Qasim regime in, in, in Iraq in 1963 and covered it in blood. NASA was physically defeated, first in... Yemen by the, the Saudis in a proxy war, and then, and, and then of course, by the Israelis in 67. Now, you can say that the, the reason why they suffered those defeats is to do with the sort of bourgeois from the top kind of, kind of methods that NASA's approach to pan-Arabism was essentially one of annexation and subordination, which happened both in Syria and, and, in, and in Yemen, very, very disastrously and so on. But nevertheless, it took, you know, decades of huge, bloody struggle to, to, to smash the nationalists. So it's, it's important, important not simply to dismiss them. Secondly, that then raises the question about to what extent the, the memory of uh, that period is still an active political force. Now, I can understand why it probably isn't in Tunisia, because the... In some sense, Ben Ali was the heir of Boumediene and, and so on. But in Egypt, um, you know, I noticed that when they were, when Tahrir Square put forward its preferred provisional government, one of the vice presidents was Hamdine Sabahi, who is the leader of Karama, which is the kind of left Nasserist party in, in Egypt. And, you know, it, I mean, in a way it relates to what Sai is saying, because I think it's, you know, Say the Brotherhood, um, you know, fails spectacularly and quickly, which is perfectly possible, given the kind of game is playing. It would be a mistake to think that the inheritor will be automatically the revolutionary left, because the revolutionary left is is very weak. You know, better it's stronger in Egypt than in most places, but it's still it's still very weak. You know, is it is it possible that the some life can be breathed into the old? the old corpse, what seems like the corpse of, of, of now secular nationalism in places like Egypt. I mean, that's a genuine question. I don't know. I'd be interested to know what, what other people thought. Uh, just uh, two points uh, before uh, I think about that, about uh, 
the future for the nationalists. First, uh, the, that last root of uh, nationalism and Islamist uh, is very interesting when you find that people uh, from countryside tend to be uh, Islamist uh, nationalists. Again, there is no a big study about that, but they tend to be middle class coming from cities, especially cities. And that's why uh, the Nasrite movement was mainly middle class movement more than really a working class movement. And the second thing, when you said about uh, Syria, and you thought that uh, it's a tend to go for liberalism, uh, I totally disagree with that. I mean, all the Ba'ath bar, uh, party in uh, Syria and Iraq, they were very eclectic parties, and because they don't have very um, clear uh, class uh, uh, root or uh, understanding for the class struggles, so that's why they were eclectic. They choose whatever is suitable to them, mm -hmm. and once they get the power, they use it. So I wouldn't say they become liberal because, uh, I mean, the Communist Party was part of the coalition with the Ba'ath Party mm -hmm. during Hamza Assad. So, um, so. Uh, they did have even the concept of liberalism about parties and election, democracy, and things like that. So I, I wouldn't call them uh, liberal as you described just because I've got the free market and things like that. What's going on in Egypt now is, is very important because uh, maybe uh, our other Arab countries will get upset about that, but I can see that they are central to the Arab revolution, even if it started in Tunisia, because of influence, because of big population. Uh, historically and things like that. Uh, I know, for example, from I haven't been there, but they say that uh, nationalists most right, they are almost the most pictures, maybe one of the most common uh, things in Tahrir Square, and maybe because they are more activist, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe they are, uh, people can correlate to that because uh, still, if you want to compare Nasser by Sadat and Mubarak, at least there is something romantic about Nasser. And uh, again, if you want to study Nasser, Nasser uh, period, I mean, it would be unfair to say that it was anti mass because Nasser was one of the people who knew how to move masses, especially in 56, mm -hmm. in the war of 56, and then nationalization of Suez Canal after that. So he, he wasn't. Uh, he was manipulating the masses more than he was frightening the masses. We know that after 1967, when he wanted to step down, uh, we know that uh, what's called the Italian strategy, which is uh, the party at that time, he managed to get like five million mm -hmm. uh, to say, no, we don't want you to step down, we want to mm -hmm. fight and go on. So uh, we, we need to think there is. There's, uh, progress in the secular national uh, movement. Uh, there was, uh, I think, three conferences in Lebanon, uh, and all of them, they have got recommendation about a new concept of freedom, and also new concept of understanding of Islam as the spiritual um, root of the Arab nation. So it's not totally the same as the Islamists who think that Islam is the only source for uh, our law and also it's uh, uh, Islam is the solution of Islam what had. So they think Islam is everything, but uh, for secular nationalism, Islam would be just a spiritual root, uh, root of um, the, uh, the nationalism. And also uh, we, they, are, they have got more progressive understanding to uh, minority, uh, Kurds, so even ethnic backgrounds as well, which I think is the new things. Uh, Amazigh in uh, North Africa, Kurds and African South Sudan. I mean, it's too late now because South Sudan now is a different country. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a new understanding and there are some attempts to, to be inclusive because Arabic, anyone speak Arabic, even in Somalia, who are Ethically, uh, ethnically, they look like an African, but because they speak Arabic, so mm -hmm. they, they can be included in Arabic, and Ar 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 Arabic uh, uh, nationalism. So I think, unfortunately, because a lot of mistakes happen in the Communist parties, like in Egypt, for example, mm -hmm. uh, 
they were very pro Soviet Union, most the most the, the main stream uh, Communist Party in Asia, and also um, because now there's a growing Islamic uh, movement. I think um, the national movement has got um, a lot of opportunity, unfortunately, uh, if you if you think about the revolutionary uh, Marxist or socialist. Uh, and I think coalition between secular, secular nationalism and, uh, and communist will be the future in the uh, Middle East because uh, uh, nationalists, they can drive to become dictatorship or they can be sort of uh, racist attitude against non-Arab. And in, in my opinion, with a coalition, coalition with uh, the left revolutionary, that can create a um, strong um, coalition for a period to, um, to oppose the Islamists and can be, uh, have some um, root in the, in the new movement, the new revolution. Uh, in response to Alex's very interesting point about whether the um, nationalist movement in Egypt uh, return in some sense to its earlier prominence. It's very interesting about uh, um, Hamdin Sabahi, as you say, being nominated as one of these people, you know, being nominated in effect by the movements of Tahrir to be uh, one of the members of a, a, an interim civilian government to be headed by Mohammed al-Baradei. That's interesting too, because he was a man who didn't have a lot of credibility a few mm -hmm. months ago, but by keeping his distance from the SCAF, you know, he's um, he, you know he finds himself nominated as a prime minister by the folks in the square, and uh, you know when I, when I was there in September, he was regarded as yesterday's man, and then this is how fast ev events are moving. But I think the Sabahi is there partly because he's been a pretty intransigent opponent of Mubarak, but also I think it, the very important thing for S Sabahi is he, he's closely identified with the cause of Palestine. It's extremely important. And the left, much of the left in Egypt, when confronted with the question over the last year, who should we vote for in the presidential election, much of the left has said, we'll vote for Sabahi because he's the only person who has taken um, an intransigent position in relation to Palestine. Now, I, think we should, but I think Palestine figures in a lot of this, um, although it's not necessarily always the headline issue. It's a very important factor. A quick point about on, on the question of the, of the Ba'ath Party in Syria. Um, I was quite surprised in, in Damascus to discover um, evidence, like, like public evidence, of the way in which the neoliberal agenda has advanced in recent years, in the sense that although you don't find the same um, uh, vulgar commercial development, as you say, in a place like Cairo, there are still shopping malls, multiplex cinemas, gated communities. Now, they've really only arrived in the last five, six years, but it's as if um, the Assads have been making up for lost time. <laughs> you know, they have embraced the IMF agenda, and they have gone very quickly. And the other thing that the, 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 the Ba'athists did in Syria was they type of used Lebanon as the neoliberal doorway, you know, the, the entry point to the world market. And mm -hmm. under the, I mean, really, the Syrians have run Lebanon, of course, for many, many years. And they, um, they facilitated the uh, privatisation, commercialisation, the rest of the Syrian economy by using Beirut. So I think it's, a very, it's an important factor. This other question of the left, I, I mean, I think the range of questions we're discussing is very interesting. I mean, although we're sitting in SOAS and so on, this is exactly what's going on, I think, in Tunis. In, in, you know, in Cairo and elsewhere, you know, you, you, you start with one question, it ramifies into all these other, it's like, you know, dealing with the whole world agenda of change. And um, this interesting question, Si, that you raised about, about the left, and, you know, we, we'll read what's happening with the left. Um, and I think that very, there are very important openings for the left, but the progress is quite modest in many ways. In, and I... I and, I think we should know the progress, the extremely important progress that has been made by, by an independent revolutionary left in particular. But that these people are starting from a, a modest base, and I 
suggest, perhaps are not very novel thoughts, that there's a direct correlation between the difficulty which the left has in re-establishing itself and the uh, problems of the legacy of Stalinism. I mean, you take Egypt, for example, you have to remember that, um, I mean, in fact, when Nasser first came to power, the local communists thought that Nasser was a fascist. That was the first reaction, that, fasci that, that, that something like European fascism had come to power. They saw a military man, and uh, in fact, there had to be uh, very quickly major discussions with Moscow, and the response came back from Moscow, no, you've got it, actually got it wrong here. This man is a, rep is, is, is a genuine representative of the progressive bourgeoisie, and the loyal Egyptian um, uh, communist current swung over to this view and very soon threw themselves fully behind Nasser. And then, although did Nasser did persecute the communists, as, as, you, as you said, in the 50s and early 60s, in 1964 the Egyptian Communist Party dissolved. Mm -hmm. It dissolved itself. So what's the point in us having an independent presence when the working class is in power? Those are the words. Mm -hmm. The workers are in power. And, and the, uh, you know, if you read the biographies of Egyptian communists, actually, you know, really serious people who struggled notwithstanding all the limitations of Stalinism, who struggled very courageously in many ways to survive on the left, that they're in prison camps and they're hearing that their party leadership has just dissolved the party. You know, that they're being punished for having been members of. And, and that's the scale of the problem in Egypt. And what I think one of the absolutely key reasons, I mean, in, we'll be talking about the problem of Islamism in, the, in a couple of weeks' time, one of the key reasons why the Islamists came onto the stage in a big way in the 60s and 70s is because the space was absolutely enormous, having been vacated by the left. And the final point here, I think that brings us to the question of Iran. I mean, anticipating discussions in a couple of weeks' time, talking to many, many Iranian um, friends over the last 20 years or so, the, the state of disorientation and distress on the Iranian left has been very, very great. But then the collapse of the Iranian left with the coming of Khomeini in 1979, of, the disorientation of the Iranian left was, was very, very great because, after all, the major organisations of the Iranian left threw their lot in with Khomeini and surrendered their independence. And, and the cost of that has been absolutely enormous. So, to return, I, I, I don't think we can at this moment put on the table um, a network of uh, so, revolutionary socialist organisations in the region and say, well, here's the alternative, folks. It's much more complicated than that. What we can say is that for the first time in generations, there is an independent uh, revolutionary socialist presence which is guided by what one might call orthodox, the tradition of orthodox Marxism, which is coming into <coughs> existence. But the struggle to assert that in the shadow of this legacy is it's taken a very, very, very long time. And the project continues. I feel it is, uh, that there are almost no reason left for sectarianism. Uh, so that's what people are, are saying. Uh, I think uh, in Tunisia there is a new initiative done by the uh, uh, younger people in, in the different uh, left. Uh, parties um, to try to unite the left. There is the, uh, there is the uh, Communist Workers Tunisian Party, there is the Watani Democratic, Democratic Patriots, there is the Etajdi, uh, which is, it comes from the old Communist uh, Party, the old French Communist Party, there is uh, Al Khot which is a new uh, coalition uh, as well uh, fared rather uh, well in the last elections and many other small groups and, and there is an initiative to, to unite uh, and, and to discuss and, and potentially to ask the old leadership to leave uh, so that's what we feel that they will eventually uh, do because uh, I heard that in, in many uh, places in Tunisia the young uh, the grassroots militants 
agreed between themselves to have a united uh, lists for the elections, but the leadership refused that because they, uh, many of them uh, had uh, wrong, you know, uh, aspirations, and um, so uh, maybe from from these people there, there will be a new left. At the same time, there there are many uh, young people who are inspired to join many many struggles. Some uh, because uh, they have been inspired by other movements in, in the Arab world and in Europe. Uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, uh, there's a, uh, an anecdote about how Tunisians have, have seen the movements in, in Europe and mainly in Wall Street. The Wall Street movement is actually very, very uh, popular in Tunisia. I remember I was once in a, in a bar where there was music, live music, and uh, time to time there's the singer would, would, would salute the revolutionaries of Tunisia, the revolutionaries of Libya, and then the revolutionaries of Wall Street. Uh, and uh, uh, as well, when, when the uh, demonstration on Wall Street got beaten up, the Tunisian Facebookers have invaded Obama's page and posted 200,000 comments in one night. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then they liked, you know, the game and invaded Berlusconi's uh, and then uh, Sarkozy. And, uh, and this proves that they are very clear in, in their mind and uh, what they like and what they hate, although many maybe a large majority of them is, uh, are, have voted for another, but uh, uh, not necessarily for the wrong reasons, maybe for, for the right reasons, because another have been uh, persecuted under Ben Ali and have fought Ben Ali very uh, bravely. So these people are able to change their minds uh, quite quickly. Uh, there are other alternatives, uh, that's one of the reasons why I spend lots of time there so to get involved. Uh, I am personally involved in a few projects. One of them is, uh, is a new web a TV on the internet, uh, which is a leftist TV, it's called Revolution TV in Arabic, Thawra TV, uh, which is maybe going to start broadcasting a couple of weeks on the internet and potentially on air. Uh, and then involved in a new satirical newspaper run by Trotsky's comrades who has been fighting against money for 20 years and has been imprisoned so for half of that time maybe and beaten up tens of times uh, and working as well on a movie uh, about the um, the workers uh, movement uh, sorry the uh, uh, student movement in, uh, in Tunisia, uh, and uh, at least in uh, in the places I know where I go, I feel that you know the left is uh, is a majority, uh, or is uh, or is very active and, and trying uh, to do things. It's more about how how to reorganize and how to draw more people and, and how to capitalize on the inevitable mistakes of Nata uh, and they will come. Uh, I think the only reason Nata didn't start making mistakes is they still cannot manage to form a government. So, you know, we'll give them some more few days and then we will we'll start uh, the real work of opposition. Okay, thank you very much.